Well, good evening and welcome to the Great Lakes Center. This is the second symposium on Christian worldview. Uh, by all rights, it should be the third, but do you remember the virus last year? We were, we were all set to roll and, and we simply had to cancel everything. So here we are, we're back, uh, stronger. I'm glad I'm not the only guy that weeps when she sings. Uh, it's, it's a problem for me. I, I shouldn't be following her. So uh, in addition to kicking this off and saying thank you, I think you've seen um, scrolling by our sponsors, and without the sponsors, we couldn't pull this off. Um, the difficulty of this event is we want it to be free. The difficulty of it being free is open seating. So it gets a little crazy, and we appreciate your tolerance and bumping around in here. Thank you. Um, the Colson Fellows Program is something I did three years ago. Uh, I did it with many other people, but two partners in crime in particular. I see one right there in the balcony, Don Armbruster. Brian Gettle's in here somewhere. And the three of us went through it as either the Three Stooges or the Three Musketeers, I'm not sure which. And, and as you finish the Colson Fellows Program, you kind of share what you're going to do for a uh, kind of next steps. Kind of like, what are you going to do with what you've learned? And uh, I either missed the memo or didn't listen. Both are possible. And um, I'm like, what do you mean? So thankfully, one March, mid-March day, uh, a couple of years ago, I woke up with this brainstorm of, I'll rent the Great Lakes Center. We had a little humor in the box office where they're like, well, we'll rent it, but what are you going to do? And I said, well, I don't know. And... Um, I also want to thank the Great Lakes Center staff. Uh, Jill, Eric, CJ back there, Mike, Duncan. Uh, without these professionals, this wouldn't happen. Uh, they, they may know how to do it, but I sure don't. Um, Pat, where's Pat Scott? I saw you somewhere. 
Promise FM Radio uh, totally helped us get this message out. Thank you. Um, Summit Ministries. Summit has a booth table in the lobby. Summit does for youth what Colson does for the adults. So if you're a grandparent, if you're a parent, and you're like, I want my kid or grandkid to sit under solid teaching, uh, Summit's a place to go. Uh, someone to talk to out there. And both Colson and Summit have made available some discounts to those of us that might want to pursue something. Um, we also, I'm, th- I'm thinking TBX, I like their former name better, called Thinkbox. I understand that. And, and they did our website for this event. Now I'm running home 
could be. Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. The word become flesh, the light shined among us, his glory It's so good to see everyone. I'm Amy Cross, and this next song was chosen by Bob, who has put this whole thing together. It's a song called You Say by Lauren Daigle. 
and I hope it touches your heart. So um, our theme tonight, we're talking about being made in the image of God. And um, I'm not a sailor, even though we're sitting here on the lake, but I do know that the winds have changed. 
the wind is strongly in our faces. Uh, people, uh, really, what, what we stand for has become somehow or another unacceptable, right? So um, the progressive secular agenda is everywhere. It's in our schools. Uh, it's made its way into some churches probably. And uh, so, you know, my, my closing line to kick us off here is uh, we need to stand for something or we could fall for anything. So put that in your hat. Uh, I want to introduce speakers, and, and we're not necessarily going in order here. I'm going in order of chairs. And uh, Kathy Cook is on the far side. She has Celebrate Kids out of Dallas. For, oh, excuse me. Uh, are, you, are you still in the nation of Texas? Oh, but not okay. Dallas. Fort Sorry. Worth. I've been misinformed. It's a big deal. It's okay if you don't get it. But. Jeremiah, do I have your town right? Jeremiah is in Houston, Texas, okay. Where God has a second home. Uh, God's second home. Uh, Christian Thinkers Society. And John Stone Street, Colorado Springs. He's the president of the Coulson Center. And last but not least, my newest acquaintance is Dr. Matthew Sleeth out of Lexington, Kentucky. So um, every year, uh, we got a couple slides here. Every year there's something called, well, let's talk about this first, Breakpoint. And John may do this as well. Breakpoint is a daily dose of the Coulson Center. Uh, most days I listen to Breakpoint. It's but a few minutes, but it's got a lot of content in it. And next one is the fellows. I kind of mentioned the Colson Fellows Program. It's not for everybody, but boy, is it going over. We have, I believe, 740 going through the nine-month program that some of us did. By the way, the bulk of our sponsors tonight are fellows of, of the past. And last but not least, Wilberforce Weekend uh, both live this past year, it was in Fort Worth. Do I have that right, Kathy? Okay. And, and John, there were uh, like 1,200 people, I believe, live. There were also 11,000, 12,000 uh, online. Uh, COVID drove up online attendance everywhere, right? We, we all needed to, to do something. With this, I'd like to introduce John Stone Street. John is the president of the Colson Center, and he's going to take us to the image of God. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Let me just say, first of all, thanks to Bob Sprott for putting this on uh, again for a second year. It's such a privilege to work with you, Bob. And let me just, I think I'm speaking for all of us when I say you are rocking that bow tie, brother. I mean, you're, <laughs> you're killing it. So well done. Just uh, next time, wear some socks. That would be great. And let's take our time to the Lord real quick. Father, we're so grateful to be here. We're grateful to be together. We're grateful for the way that you have orchestrated our lives. For some of us, that's an easier story than others. And yet at the core of who we are is that we bear your image. Give us a glimpse this evening on what that means, what that requires, what that says about who we are, uh, our identity, and what that means in this cultural moment, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I have a very easy job tonight. My job is to set the stage for the incredible uh, content that you're going to hear for the rest of the evening, evening from my friends. Uh, the Colson Center tries to take biblical truth and use it as a lens to understand our cultural moment. Does that make sense? In other words, we believe that when the Bible says something that it's actually true. It's not just true for us. It's not just true for you and not for me or true for me and not for you, but it's actually true. That the biblical story, the biblical account of reality is nothing less than that. It actually describes the world as it actually is. And at the very beginning of the biblical story, the Bible makes a statement about who we are. The Bible says that you and I are made in the image and in the likeness of God. This is one of those ideas that I think a lot of Christians know. They, you know, for example, if we went from church to church to church or Christian group to Christian group and we said, hey, everybody, fill in the blank. Humans are made in the, and we'd all say in the image of God. But when you'd start maybe digging a little bit deeper, scratching past that surface and asking questions like, well, what does that mean? What is it? 
What difference does it make that we're in the image of God and not, for example, the product of evolutionary biology? Or what does it mean that we're actually made in the image of God? And how does that speak to some of the big questions and challenges of our cultural moment? The things that we hear about who we are, you know, whether it's talking about issues of sexuality or issues of race or issues of all kinds of things that we hear put a label on us. And we say, well, what difference does the image of God make with all of those things? Then I think you hear a lot more crickets in other words here we have this rich truth about what it means to be human in a cultural moment where that is up in the air and many Christians are left speechless when it comes to these fundamental issues and these fundamental questions we spent the last year and a half or more at the Colson Center trying to scratch past the surface, trying to dig deeper on what it means to be made in the image and likeness of God. Bob mentioned the daily Breakpoint commentary. Some of you guys remember hearing Chuck Colson's voice on the radio with Breakpoint. Yeah. And I've had the privilege of carrying on those daily commentaries on the culture. And I tell you, if you listen to Breakpoint five days a week, four of those days we'll be talking about something having to do with identity and what it means to be human and what it means to be made in the image of God. We, uh, the Colson Fellows Program that, Bo- that, that Bob mentioned, this nine-month deep dive into Christian worldview. We've got 740 people in 60 different cities across the United States who are going to spend the next nine months diving deep into Christian worldview. And I guarantee you one of the issues that they will dive deep on is this question, what does the image of God mean? What is the image of God? What difference does it make? And the Wilberforce Weekend uh, conference that we hosted, it's our big kind of family reunion each and every year. It was down in Fort Worth just a few months ago. What you're hearing tonight is just a snippet. In fact, Kathy and Matthew were with us there in Fort Worth. Jeremiah was there a couple years ago. But we're going to be diving deep in kind of a summary here of what we dealt with there at the Wilberforce Weekend. I, the, the longer I look at this, uh, this, this beautiful truth, the longer that I study, the longer that I think about the image of God and see it through the narrative of Scripture, there's this line uh, that a bishop, and Jeremiah knows this probably, who said this and when he said it, and I don't, so forgive me. Uh, but there was a bishop who said something about the Gospel of John years, uh, centuries ago, and, and I love it. It's a beautiful uh, sentiment. Here, here's what he said. He said, the Gospel of John is a pool in which a child can wade and an elephant can swim. In other words, this well goes deep. It goes as deep as you can possibly take it. I don't know a better description of the image of God than this. When you actually get past the answer to the trivia question, humans are made in the image of God, and you actually dive deep into what it means, this is something that can change the life of a child, and it's something that can completely reorient the perspective of any one of us. And the more we study it, the more it opens up its riches to us. I want to give you, just as we start here, three reasons why the image of God is an essential thing for us to know as followers of Christ. Number one, the image of God has been among the most consequential ideas in all of human history. There are ideas that don't make much of a difference. And then there are ideas that literally change the world. Among the most consequential ideas in all of human history is this idea that humans are made in the image of God. You see, we have these ideas that are deeply embedded in Western culture right now. Ideas like human dignity. Ideas like value, universal human value. Now, we might not agree on what those words mean. We might not agree on where those things come from. But I will tell you this. These weren't ideas that always existed in human civilizations. These weren't ideas. In fact, where do you get this idea? Let's take it from our founding documents. You know the line, right? We hold these truths to be what? Self-evident. That all men are created. Is that a self-evident thing? I mean, seriously, look around the room and tell me if the first thing that comes to mind is that we're all the same. Seriously, look around. Is that a self-evident thing? Look again. Seriously, look again. No, the most self-evident thing when we encounter other people is not that we're the same. It's not that we have anything shared. The most fundamental thing that comes to mind is that we are all what? 
different. And so when our founder said that it's self-evident, by the way, that's a reality that was put into the, cons- uh, into the Declaration of Independence, into the founding narrative of our nation before we even knew how to live it out. And we weren't able to even live that truth out, and yet there it was. But what is self-evident? The most self-evident thing is not that we're the same. It's not that we're common. It's not that we have shared aspects of who we are. The most self-evident thing is that we are all what? We're all different. So where does this idea come from? Well, it can't come from anything we share on the outside because we don't have something that we all share as human beings on the outside. It can't be an extrinsic quality of who we are. It's got to be based on something that we all share on the what? It's got to be something non-physical. It's got to be something intrinsic. And you can walk through the different religions and the different belief systems. And the image of God is absolutely unique. And the image of God has actually given the world a grounding for these ideas of dignity and value and worth. And these things that have made the world a better place. By the way, don't take my word for this. I'll quote two atheists for you quickly that talk about how these ideas owe their existence to Christianity. One of the great atheist philosophers in all of history, Frederick Nietzsche. Have you ever heard that guy? He's famous for saying God is dead. He also said that the idea of human dignity, shared universal human value, owes itself to Christianity. He didn't think it was a good idea, by the way. He thought it was weakness, but he recognized that it was only Christianity that could ground that. More, and a more modern source is an atheist philosopher named Luke Ferry. He teaches philosophy at the University of Paris. About five years ago or so, he wrote a book called A Brief History of Thought. It's kind of an intellectual history of Western ideas. Now, I know that doesn't sound very exciting to many of you, but this is actually a pretty interesting book. And he has this whole chapter in this book on Christianity. And he talks about in an interview how his atheist buddies gave him a hard time because he said, you're writing a book on philosophy. Why are you including a religion? Religion doesn't belong in a book on philosophy. And he actually admitted to being grumpy himself to including a chapter on Christianity in his own book on philosophy. But he said he had to, and here's what he said. He said, because Christianity was to introduce the notion that humans were equal in dignity. On the inside, not on the outside. That humans were equal in dignity. It was an idea, he said, unprecedented at the time, and one to which the world owes its entire democratic inheritance. The idea of the image of God. And oh, by the way, then he goes on in a case of double negatives in translation. He said, but this idea didn't come from nowhere. And he goes on to talk about where did it come from in Christianity. And he points specifically to this truth that's found in Scripture. That humans are made in the image and likeness of God. So number one, one of the first reasons you need to know about the image of God is it's been among the most consequential ideas in all of human history. Number two, you need to know about the image of God because it is core to a Christian worldview. It is not just a peripheral truth of a Christian vision of life in the world. It is core. Now, I grew up in a church where sometimes my pastor would try to convince us that what he was saying was really important by counting the number of Bible references about that thing. Anybody grew up in a church like that? You know what I mean? And he would say, you need to know about hell because Jesus talked more about hell than he did about heaven. And God talks more about money than anything else. And you add this up. Well, if that's our criteria for how important an idea is, the image of God's not very important at all. It's only mentioned, depending on how many things get lumped into the category, five, six, seven times. But the reason it's central, the reason it's core to a Christian worldview is because the Bible's not just given to us in a random collection of stories or proverbs or truths. The Bible's given to us in a grand sweeping story of life in the world, isn't it? It begins in the what? Beginning. And it takes you all the way to the, no, not the end, the new beginning. (laughs) Haven't you read Narnia? Yes. The story of Scripture is the story from the creation of the heavens and earth to the new heavens and new earth. And in any story, a very, very crucial thing is who are the characters? Now we know the storyteller, the narrator, the one orchestrating the whole account, that's God. He's the most important character because he's not only the one telling the story, he then becomes the central character in the story. Fair enough? But how does he do that? 
the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. So God becomes a human person. And that human person is central to the story from the very beginning. There's a lot of things God creates. In Genesis 1, we only read one that bears his image. There's a lot of things that went wrong. What was the start of all of those things in the story going wrong? It was the fall of the image bearer. If a giraffe had eaten of the tree of the knowledge and good and evil, it wouldn't have been a big deal. But it wasn't a giraffe, it was the image bearer. Right? In other words, core to understanding the biblical account of reality, core to understanding what it means to live in God's truth, core to understanding who we are. By the way, before the Bible tells us what it means to be Christian, the Bible tells us what it means to be human. And all the words for becoming a Christian are rewords. Have you noticed that? Renew, restore, redeem, repent, regenerate. Rewords always imply what? Again, so here it is. If you're, follow, if you're in Christ, if you're a Christian, then God is not making you something that he did not first create you to be. So the idea of the image of God is one of the most consequential in all of human history. The idea of the image of God is core to understanding a Christian vision of life in the world. And finally, and this is critical for what we're going to talk about for the rest of this evening. The idea of the image of God is a central truth that Christians must understand to make sense of our cultural moment. How many of you guys are a little bit dizzy about how quickly things have gone in our culture from being unthinkable to unquestionable? How many of you guys are feeling like you're in a boat and that thing is just drifting all over the place? How, do you, how many of you, and I don't mean just because we're at a bay, that was a loaded now, I didn't actually mean to say that. I'm just so grateful to be up here near the water in August, not February, so thank you. Um, the culture is relentless, isn't it? It's one thing after another, after another, after another. How do you make sense of it all? Well, many of us, many Christians in particular, will look at how much things have changed so quickly over the last several decades and we'll think that the main headline of the whole story has been a moral one. In other words, the story is that things that were once considered wrong are now considered right. And things that were once considered right are now considered wrong. I don't think that's the whole story. Now, don't get me wrong. There have been incredible moral shifts. That's obvious enough, isn't it? My point is the moral shifts that we have undergone over the last several decades have not been the root of the problem. They've been the fruit. They're not the cause, that's the effect. What's causing all of these moral shifts is a much deeper shift. A shift in our understanding of the world itself, specifically our understanding of what it means to be human. The great sociologist Peter Berger put it this way, that modern man is inflicted with a perpetual identity crisis. In other words, at the root of all of our drifting, at the root of all of our problems, at the root of what I call identity tourism, that so many people, especially young people, feel the need to embark in on today. Going from one identity to the next identity to the next identity to the next identity. At the root of that is a loss of their understanding of who they are. Matthew Sleet's going to end up our night. He's going to address a very, very difficult topic. That's, central, that's a central topic on a lot of our minds. We've put them into a category, category called deaths from despair. How many of you have heard of that phrase? That in our culture right now, a significant number of deaths that are recorded are deaths that have to do with suicide, overdoses, dying alone, self-abusive behavior, things like that. That's a really hard topic, isn't it? But let me just tell you, Christians are always at their best, not when they're running away from the plagues, but when they're running into the plagues with hope and with truth. So if we're going to fulfill our moment, if we're going to fulfill our calling to take the truth of the gospel to a world that needs it most, we're going to have to understand this idea of the image of God. We're going to have to believe it. That's what Kathy's going to talk about. This idea that what it means to be made in the image of God is to actually believe something about God and therefore to believe something about ourselves. And what Jeremiah is going to talk about is, among other things, is, is how 
big of a difference this idea of the image of God has made throughout history. So that's where we're going, okay? Are you guys ready? All right, it's going to be a full evening. Now, again, as I mentioned before, what we're, you're going to hear is kind of a small taste of an entire weekend we spent diving deep into this issue, the image of God at our Wilberforce weekend. All of these videos, including a few additional sessions, are available on the website wilberforceweekend.org, wilberforceweekend.org. And if you type in the code Bay Harbor, we'll give you 50% off that, uh, and you can have access to the entire scope of teaching. And you'll get a more of a taste of it here as we go along. So now I'm going to invite my friend Dr. Jeremiah Johnston to come up and take us further into this topic. Thank you, John. I have two points I'm going to share with you this evening about how we can specifically live and reflect the image of God in the world around us. I'm a kind of guy, I like immediate next steps. How about you? John has just set the theological, philosophical foundation. How can we walk out of here today different and immediately impact our communities, be it Bay Harbor, Northern Michigan, wherever you're watching from, either tonight or later through multimedia. Let me encourage you with these two points and three stories. I don't want you to miss it. I'm going to do something tonight I don't normally do, but I would like to dedicate my message to my little sister, Jenny Lee. I had the privilege to watch her the last two days, put one foot in front of the other here, visiting us with her husband, Jeff. They have three children, and their third child, Wesley Vance Mulliken, was stillborn a little bit more than a month ago. And watching Jenny Lee the last month has been an inspiration to me, and it inspired my message tonight, from which, having a PhD in resurrection studies, I share with, in all humility, I saw something in the last month I had never seen before, studying this incredible passage from the 11th chapter of John. And I would like to simply teach you what the Holy Spirit has taught me as we've lamented my little sister, Jenny Lee, Jeff, Sadie, Savannah, and Wesley Vance Mulliken, who Jenny Lee wrote the first time he opened his eyes, he saw Jesus Christ. So Jenny Lee, I am really touched to be among believers tonight. And this message, I think, ends in hope and it has inspired my comments and the applicable points therein. This is Sydney, Australia. Those of you that have been that would immediately recognize this as the famous, kind of like Bay Harbor, Michigan, a picturesque scene into the east of Sydney Harbor. These are the beautiful sandstone cliffs that's affectionately referred to as the Gap. And for nearly 50 years, an angel walked among the individuals at the Gap, at this beautiful Sydney Harbor that incidentally is surrounded by serene homes, million dollar properties. It's a famous, famous place. But as you can see, it has only a three foot high fence and famous as it is, is a picturesque scene looking out over the sea east of Sydney. It is infamous as one of the most famous suicide spots in the world. Enter in Mr. Don Ritchie, affectionately known now as the Angel of the Gap. Mr. Ritchie sold bacon cutters and kitchen appliances, but he had this amazing ability to practice the image of God every day by simply opening his windows because he lived about 50 meters, 164 feet or so, from this fence line, and he would have the discernment to notice if somebody was lingering just a little bit too long at the fence line, at the gap. Sometimes even in his bathrobe, he would leave, he would walk out, and he would walk up to an individual, and he would say, I'm Don. And he did this really powerful thing. He smiled. Would you like to come for a cup of tea or breakfast at my house? Don was given the highest award, and it was cut off in this photo, but the Medal of the Order of Australia, the highest civilian honor because over the course of 50 years, a man with no degree in psychology, no degree in mental health training, but someone who pr knew how to practice the ministry of presence, knew how to walk up to someone, and he later said, I used to sell kitchen appliances, 
I walk to the gap to sell people life. He would ask them for a beer, tea, or breakfast, and he was recognized officially as saving 160 lives, although Don says he doesn't count. And recently at his funeral in 2012, his son stood up and said it was more like dad saved four or 500. Don is illustrative of the first, first point of my message this evening. We have to know how to practice the ministry of presence if we are going to truly reflect the image of God in the world around us. And we're going to have to get our hands dirty in the process. We cannot wait for people to clean themselves up, to look religious, to speak the way we speak, to like the things we like as much as we do. We're going to learn tonight why it is important to get our hands dirty, because that's what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross. I've been asked thousands of questions from Christians across the United Kingdom, Canada, the United States, and the number one question that I've been asked by believers is how Christians should respond to suicide and mental health, because every one of you here tonight, whether you admit it to yourself or not, are somewhere, somewhere along the mental health trajectory. And as I'll remind you tonight, without the grace of God, we are all more dangerous to ourselves than we are to anyone else around us. We all need to be saved from ourselves. And I'm going to show you a photograph at the end of my message to where if you don't hear anything else that I say tonight, I hope you'll take a picture of it and remember there's always hope. I have a book coming out in a few weeks called Unleashing Peace. How many of you want more of God's peace in your life? I do. I want more of the shalom of God. I wanted to study it. It's coming out soon. And so some of the things you'll learn tonight come out from this new book. These are very difficult questions, and John did such a tremendous job, as always, of, of teeing up how important and consequential this dialogue is that we're having tonight at the Great Lakes Symposium on Christian Worldview. Can I just encourage you to follow the greatest commandment? Jesus modifies the Shema as only he can in Matthew 22 and Mark 12, and as only Jesus can do, he adds a word to it. You remember the Shema, love the Lord your God with your heart, your soul, and your strength. Jesus says we also need to love him with our minds and with all our minds. We have to think ourselves through some of these difficult questions. We are in a crisis of despair, as John mentioned. The church has a responsibility to run to this question of mental health, mental challenges, mental wellnesses, and to stop being silent, stop the shame and exclusion, and remember, have that adage, you know, uh, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to uh, beat someone who never gives up. That needs to be the adage of the church as it relates to this. But we have to speak through it intelligently. These are very intelligent questions, and we need to up our game intellectually as followers of Jesus. We need more than a few Delta Force Christians on the stage. And all God's people said, Amen. we need every one of you on board saying, I don't care how old I am. I'm going to leave here tonight making a decision to be a Christian thinker. I'm going to listen to everyone. No one will outthink me. Are you willing to up your intellectual game? I love this. This is my paraphrase of Augustine, Anti-Pelagian Writings, chapter 5. As a believer in Jesus Christ, we are inviting you to think in believing and believe in thinking. Don't ever let someone tell you that you have to check your brain at the door to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Let me give you another emblematic example of how difficult this was for me. I grew up and I am blessed with a great Christian heritage, a heritage that goes all the way back to Western Michigan, Hudsonville, Jenison, Borculo, Michigan, for any of you who have ever heard of that. When I went to Bible college and then eventually studying in Oxford, I had no idea that there were Bible scholars who did not believe the Bible. That seemed like an oxymoron to me. To tell you how easily it is to become deceived, and we can all become deceived, by the way, this is a book that rocked biblical scholarship. You don't really need to know what it's about. It really isn't important. Other than that, it changed Pauline studies uh, for a generation. This is Ed Sanders, E.P. Sanders. This is his book, Paul and Palestinian Judaism. And I'm inviting you to look at the index. I know it's real exciting. In the top right, do you see his index, truth, comma, ultimate? 
And do you see there are three pages listed in the great Professor Sanders' books, uh, book on ultimate truth? And if I could pass the book down the line this evening, you would know that all three of those pages are blank pages. This is what we're up against, even among biblical scholars. We no longer can define truth. If we cannot define truth, it's an, it's an invitation for new truth to be inserted. Your job tonight as a Christian thinker is to do what Pascal said, who died at the age of 39. Uh, his writings were later published, Ponce in French, Ponce, his thoughts. Your job as a Christian thinker is to present the Christian faith in such a way that men and women wish it were true and then show them that it is. Are you able to present the truths of the gospel in a way that is winsome, not provoking, to where your greatest enemy, they may disagree, but by golly, they wish it were true. That's our job, and that's why, Bob, I thank God for events like tonight where we can learn to do it more effectively. I've been asked many questions. These are the two ways that I have prayerfully sought the Holy Spirit's guidance of how we can reflect the image of God in immediate steps. I hope you won't forget step number one, take off those grave clothes. Take off those grave clothes. And number two, I'm inviting you to change your rhetoric from if only, because we all have if only X's in our life, to if Jesus. Those are my two points. I mentioned to you very briefly, this is the Sackler Library. Those of you that have been to Oxford, this is the Griffith Papyrology. You, you swipe your bodily and A card twice to get through. And there's a half million fragments, by the way, that have, not been, uh, that have not been cataloged. So if you want great job security, become a paleographer or a codicologist, and you'll, you'll have great job security. There's a lot of work to be done. I mentioned that just to let you know that Having written a 93,000-word thesis that's now published in the Jewish and Christian text monograph series on the history of resurrection belief and the Judeo-Christian motif, going through this challenge with my little sister or watching her go through it, I learned something, and like my grandpa taught me when I would phone him home from Oxford many years ago, he'd say, now Jeremy, as he called me, it's what you learn after you know it all that really matters, son. So <laughs> good old adage from the greatest generation. In John chapter 11, Jesus is approached. If you know the passage, I'll summarize it. Lazarus, the one you love, he's sick. We don't know why. We may never get an explanation. Jesus delays four days. In Jewish burial traditions at the time, when you study these things, it was believed that the soul of the body of the dead Jew would hover over the body for three days. On the fourth day, the soul would leave the body the face would kind of gnarl. In other words, on day four, you were as dead as dead could be. We don't know that because of our historical distance reading the Gospels. Jesus is only a day's journey from his dear friend Lazarus. It means Eliezer in Hebrew. He waits. <laughs> Jesus then says, believing is seeing. Remember, those of you that believe will see what happens. So believing is seeing with Jesus. He delays. He's only a day's journey, 20 miles in that day. He could have been there in a day. He waits. In fact, Lazarus is probably already dead by the time the messenger meets him. Jesus, of course, you know the story. He approaches the tomb. He finally makes it four days later. It's one of two places in the Gospels we actually hear that Jesus shouts, Duro exo! That was what he would have shouted in Greek. And it's literally like, Lazarus, out here! And oh, by the way, do you remember, uh, there's always a Pharisee in the crowd when we teach the Bible. Uh, Jesus, you really want us to move the stone? His body, remember the good King James authorized version? He stinketh. <laughs> remember that? Duro exo. This is the part where I can do a better job as your speaker tonight, reflecting the image of God. Jesus says he comes out, he can barely walk, he's wrapped in burial clothes, and Jesus, of course we see the passage, the dead man came out, his hands, his feet wrapped with strips of linen, a cloth around his face, totally consistent with Jewish burial traditions. This is the part I had not seen before. 
Jesus says to them, the crowd, take off those grave clothes and let him go. This is a beautiful painting by Jacopo Tintoretto, a Venice artist in the 16th century. Incidentally, uh, I think he painted this during a plague, by the way. Um, I love this image. Jesus doesn't call the linens to fall off. Jesus doesn't take the linens off. He calls the community around the man who stinks, the man who's been transformed on the inside, but he still can't walk. He's been saved, but he can hardly move. And he needs the community of believers to come around him and to get their hands dirty, to believe in him, not walk away from him, and to do one thing, get those grave clothes off. And Jesus said, let him go home. It's a beautiful statement. If we're going to rehumanize humanity, and my message two years ago here was about dehumanizing humanity, that's what happened without Christ. God is restoring me in his image by conforming me to the image of Christ. Some of us, we are far too religious, and, and as much as we don't want to admit it, far too pharisaical. When's the last time you got your hands dirty to help someone take those grave clothes off? Now look closely at this image with me. Do you see all the people who are helping poor Lazarus get those stinky grave clothes off? Where do you see yourself in this painting? You might be Lazarus and you've been changed, but you're dealing with something tonight. Something that's holding you back, some lie from the enemy that it's hard, it's hard to let go of. Will you allow someone in your life to help you take those drape, grave clothes off? This is how we can immediately impact our world through the image of restoring that image of God in the world only by reflecting Jesus Christ. Why do you think Paul says in Romans 6, you've got to put some things to death even though you're a Christian? John says it differently. You've got to take those stinky grave clothes off. And ladies and gentlemen, we are in a war for truth today. And we've got to get the blinders off our eyes. Like Lazarus had been changed. He had been resurrected. He still needed to take those blinders off. Friends, we need to make that decision this evening so we can do that. Point number two. Live by if Jesus, not if only. It's a cryptic passage for me in verse 21 and in verse 32. Martha and Mary are approaching Jesus, and I can see them, can't you? They're good friends with Jesus. Lord, if you just would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. It's interesting, this almost the exact same verse, except it's verse 32. This time it's Mary. You think they had had this conversation as serious? Where is Jesus when we need him the most? Mary, Lord, I thought of my little sister, Jenny Lee. If you just would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Something really powerful happens. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And do you remember what he said? Do you believe this? So believing is seeing with Jesus. So the implication for you and me as we attempt to reflect the image of Christ is that we should not quickly assume that God has let us down when we are in our most challenging moment. And my challenge to you is I am exhausted as someone who is on the front lines as a defender of the faith. And I am looking to my right and the left Wondering, like the amazing Colson Center, where are all the other ministries? Where are all the other ministries that are willing to say, Lord, my reputation is in your hand. I'm going to speak truth no matter what. And I'm going to do it boldly. I'm not going to apologize about it. I'm going to know it. I'm not going to let anyone out think me. And you know what? I'm going to be all about redemption. I've been a Christian for 33 years, and I'd like to think I'm becoming less and less judgmental and more and more grace-filled. There's a lot of people out there tonight, they're Christians, but they have grave clothes wrapped all around them. And you know what? That would be me were it not for grace in my life in that area. What have I learned? Four things, and this is out in my new book, and I have some of this in a resource that's available. This is what the Lord has taught me, and you could literally write a book on these four points, so I did. Live by faith in God's promises, not in God's explanations. No one in the Bible 
receives an explanation that allies their fears or is the medicinal balm of Gilead that they need. A lot of people ask God, why does something happen? Lord, if you would have just been here, my brother would have died. Lord, why did you wait four days? We don't get an answer. We just see God show up and he shows how powerful he is, even in the midst of that ugly, stinky situation. He can do that in your life. Number two, God doesn't give explanations to us. And I want to say this is a ministry that loves to equip you with answers to your faith. Can I tell you in humility, some things are so weird, so challenging, so sinful, there is no answer for it. We just have to live by God's promise. He's coming. We don't know when. We know Jesus is on the way. God doesn't give explanations. As we learned in Habakkuk, if you, go, if you want to go read 56 verses that will bless your life, go read the 56 verses of Habakkuk. It's his prayer diary. He was a professional warrior, kind of like me. God doesn't give explanations. He gives a greater revelation of himself. So when you lock into that greater revelation of God, you then reflect that image of God to the world around you. Watching, I I would like to think of myself as an apologist, as a speaker of truth. I've seen more apologetics from my little sister Jenny Lee and how she suffered losing her son than I've seen in a lot of places that have a lot of degrees and a lot of answers. We're going to suffer for our faith, ladies and gentlemen, and I pray that we suffer in a way that's faithful, not perfect. It's ugly. We need the world around us. We need our community of believers around us. It's ugly. It's no one suffers perfectly, but perhaps the greatest apologetic is this ability to suffer well, isn't it? Fourthly, God is in control even when I don't feel he's in control. Go read Psalm 42 and 43, originally one psalm. The worst thing that you can do before you try to reflect the image of God is to listen to your heart, ladies and gentlemen. You have to speak to your heart. Did you know that? (laughs) Jeremiah the prophet said, Our hearts are desperately wicked above all things. Who can know them? So please don't go listen to your heart about anything. Psalm 42 and 43, why are you downcast, my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Put your hope in God. Do you see how David, who may have wrote it, is talking to his heart? Lord, I don't feel you. I know you're there. Lord, I don't feel you. I know you're there. I love Tim Keller. (laughs) This is such a great quote. There's a stupid piece and there's a smart piece. The Christian piece is not by making yourself stupid. It's by making yourself as aware and as thoughtful of your beliefs as possible. You need to be a Christian thinker because your day of adversity perhaps is upon you. Perhaps it's coming. I can assure you that it is. And yet when you commit to be a Christian thinker, when you commit to live on if, if Jesus rather than if only, you watch how you reflect Jesus and the image of God in a world around you so strongly It will become undeniable and unimpeachable for the people that watch you. It's a powerful statement. I close with this, and I hope you'll get a picture, get snap a photo of this photo, this uh, picture. I've shown this picture all over the world, literally. If you've lived in London uh, or the UK as I do, I quickly learned that pedestrians do not have the right of way when you try to cross the street. Have you noticed that? Those black cabbies will literally run you over. It's not like in America where pedestrians, I think, have the right of way. That's, con- that's contextually important because this young man picked one of the busiest intersections in North London, Golders Green, and I'm not quite sure how he did, I don't know the story of how he even got around this, this, this footbridge barricade, Uh, But he must have been determined that day to take his life. You have to have determination to get to that point. This young man had grave clothes all over him. Men and women are walking home from work that day. You don't, by the way, it makes me a five-point Calvinist predestination. Are you telling me someone had a a rope walking home from work that day? That's (laughs) That's another subject. Instantly, as John has mentioned before, we have a God conscience within us. Strangers are walking across that footbridge. They probably want to get home. They're probably exhausted, half irritated, want to know what they're going to eat, plop in front of Netflix and call it a day, and they see this young man getting ready to take his life. 
these men and women who do not know each other collapse around this young man. Do you see that hand holding his belt? Someone is down here. They're on the ground. I've got his calf muscles. Do you have him? Lasso him. Who's the man or woman with the brown sleeves? I've got you. I've got you. When I look at that bridge, I think of any of my five children. I think of my wife. I think of myself. And I'm reminded all of us need to be saved from ourselves. We need someone that will come take our grave clothes off. Sure, you might be a Christian, but you need someone who will believe in you. You need someone who will love you, who will encourage you, and who will speak truth in your life. So tonight, my encouragement to you, take those grave clothes off your life first. And you can't do it in isolation. You need the church. You need community. You need your pastor. Number two, practice the ministry of presence, as Don Ritchie did, the angel of the gap. Number three, Let me encourage you to replace your if-onlys with if-Jesus. And I believe those are some immediate steps to how we can begin to actually reflect a faith, a faith that is genuine because it will meet you at your greatest point of need. If you've not embraced the gospel of Jesus Christ in your life, that is step number one. Not religion, not confirmation, the gospel of Jesus Christ. I close with this before our humanity break. Our ministry loves to provide resources to you, and unfortunately, you're going to forget 88% of what I just said, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sorry to tell you that. Um, We have created a resource unique to this event. My publisher hates that we offer this, uh, but I'm here to equip and resource you as well as I can. So I put together a little jump drive. It says Christian Thinker Society on it. It has 306 of my PowerPoint slides on it. You can use them. They have my presenter notes. I answer 79 questions and 64 hours of audio and video teaching, 68,000 words of articles, New Testament lecture notes, best evidences, trending questions. Then I've had the privilege to interview 50 top thinkers in the world. So if I could come to your house for a week and bring one of them is John Stone Street, one of the 50, and just hang out with you for a week, This is everything I would want to teach you from how to interpret the Bible to my most recommended New Testament commentaries. Then I just want to give you my lecture notes. It's been my privilege tonight to talk to you about how we can reflect the image of God. And I would invite you, if you can think about it, to please pray for my little sister, Jenny Lee. Thank you very much. Bob, I'll turn it back to you. Yes.
So um, I would like to introduce and thank the musicians tonight. Amy and Steve Cross, husband and wife, they can sing like birds. I mean, it's, it's awesome. <laughs> Philip Alejo, am I saying it correctly? Yes. And Dr. Chris Luba is hiding back there somewhere. There he is. So thank you guys. Good evening. Oh, thank you. What a pleasure to be here. It's such an honor. Appreciate John inviting me. Appreciate Liz. Oh, I'll pose. You, they're trying to be so invisible. Let's just admit there's a photographer in the room. Okay, do I look good? <laughs> like, it's all about the social media moment. Come on. Are you satisfied? Is it good? Okay. Let, let's just go there. Um, so, and um, Bob, oh, you and your people. You've treated us like royalty. We're, we're staying like in good places and they're feeding us and it's, I like it here. I would come back. Um, I used to live in Green Bay, uh, so I'm familiar with the area, but now I do live in Fort Worth. Uh, very different place. I like it there too. Um, Heidi, the hostess with the mostest, I don't know if you're in the room, but what a joy. Um, just, it's been just great to be here. And I'm going to talk about how God made us good. God did create us in his image. You've heard that tonight, of course. And, you know, God is good, and he's a good creator. And people have to believe that in order for it to be a good thing that they're created in his image. Right? If they don't know God, or if they don't know God is good, then being created in his image is meaningless, or even worse, maybe it's a bad idea. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. And then just in case people weren't paying attention, he repeats it in the same verse. In the image of God, he created them. I mean, just in case you needed it repeated. And then it ends with male and female. He created them. God had so much love to share that he created people. He didn't have to create you. And he did not have to create you, you. But he did. He didn't have to create us in his image. But oh, praise God that he did. He's a good creator. He wanted you. And he wanted you, you. It's a powerful truth. God is a personal creator. Not only is God good and God is a good creator. But we believe, of course, that God is a personal creator. He does not use an assembly line approach when creating people, obviously. Or animals. He doesn't have a one-model-fits-all mentality. Even your triplets, sir, are uniquely different, which I'll say praise God because I'm not raising them. Um, so <laughs> you, you might prefer that they're the same. But, you know, God creates every person intentionally, personally, and uniquely. He knows what he is doing when he makes us us. He has a vision for our lives. When he chose us to make us, he planned that you would put his goodness on display. His hope for you that you would know his hope and put his goodness on display. You were created on purpose, with purpose, for purpose. Be grateful. I want kids to live long. My ministry is called Celebrate Kids. I do a lot of parent education, work with children of all ages. I want kids to live long and be strong, to find out why they are the who they are. I want parents, grandparents, teachers, aunts, uncles, pastors, and community leaders and neighbors to believe in them becoming who God wanted them to be when he chose in his love to make them who he made them to be. It is never too late. Is there anybody here wondering who you're still becoming? <laughs> is there anybody who wants to go, I'd like to know, Kathy, why am I the who I am? Raise your hand. Let's just go vulnerable and admit it. Uh, and your neighbors are like, yeah, about time she figures it out. Um, <laughs> possibly. Well, Isaiah understood. Isaiah understood the personal intentionality of a very good God. We can read in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 8, O Lord, you are our Father, and we are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hands. Say we. we. Say it again. We. And say all. We are all the work of his hand. We used to be a lump of clay. He sat there, stood there, looked at it, and wondered, who should I make this time? Oh, I think I'll make them a girl. They're going to love that. They'll be so surprised. <laughs> and I'm going to give her long fingers so she can play piano a bit more easily like her mom. Oh, her mom will love that so. 
I'm going to make her analytic like the dad. The mom won't like it. Dad, well, it'll be all right. <laughs> and then, no one knows this yet, but she's going to need a really big heart to love hard the brother they don't even have yet. <laughs> and I'm going to give her a big heart. He gives thought to his personal, intentional, creative creation. I wish we would get our identity from him. He's placed it in us. Every person has worth. We're created on purpose with purpose for purpose. God decided and here we are. We're wanted. We were. We are. We're here. Every person conceived is not a surprise from God. There's no unexpected pregnancy from the perspective of God Almighty. We might wonder, why did he think that was a good idea to give that person a child? It's not up to us. <laughs> not up to us. How many of you are glad it's not up to you? I mean, now that'll preach. Okay, so before I go further, you know, I'm just testing you and you're testing me and it's good. I appreciate it. Um, so I'm pro-life. Let me just put that out there. And I'm pro-eternal life. And I'm pro-abundant life, which starts while we're living on earth. And I'm pro-living. And that's where it starts. How many of you know people alive not living? Dying day by day, committing what I call, sir, intellectual suicide, emotional suicide, social suicide, and spiritual suicide, giving it up. It all starts with being pro-living because God did a good thing when he chose his love to make me me, and I'm going to prove it by becoming who he chose for me to be. Ephesians 2.10 declares that we are his workmanship or his masterpiece. We're created in Christ Jesus for good works. That's a biblical truth, and the whole Bible is true today. And it says that every person, there's no comma except you. There's no comma except your brother. No, it's every person was created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are created on purpose with purpose for purpose. There is hope here. It's a Christian virtue. It can lift despair. Say this, we are created. We are created. Say we are created. And say, we are created. created. Do you believe that? And the believing of your believing, it changes everything. And to help the neighbors here and your community here believe that, what good works has God placed within you that you don't even know are there yet? Are you pro-living enough to find out what they are? And what about the people who live around you? One of the things that makes us good is the good gifts in us. I was created as a chatty Cathy. My na- I was not named after the doll, could have been. Um, I own one, by the way. Uh, she says repetitive, rather stupid things. But um, anyway, I was created to be a chatty Cathy. My nickname at age three. My parents chose to see all the words in me as a gift to develop and not a problem to eliminate. And if that were not the case, I would not be here tonight. I can almost guarantee you that the things that drive you nuts about yourself and all the children you know are their strengths gone bad, not their weaknesses. I want you to raise the children you were given and not the children you wish you had. Some of you dreamt a long dream before you ever conceived. I might be talking about adult children. I might be talking about grandchildren, nieces and nephews, students, people in your church. To accept them for who they are. Not to accept their sin, not to accept their negative choices, but to accept who they are. Uh, My favorite book when I was a child was a thesaurus. True story. (laughs) I know, people think that's weird. I now write books using a thesaurus. I joined drama. When I was about 10, mom and dad said, go talk there a while. (laughs) True story. That's where I learned to be on a stage. That's where I learned tone of voice, facial expression, body. Where am I today? On a stage. I have a revolutionary thought for you. Are you ready? Childhood causes adulthood. (laughs) I I didn't stay up late to figure that out. I mean, today matters. Today shows up. How many of you know today shows up? So proud of you for being here. Because today shows up. So proud of you for caring about who you are, who you are becoming, the things that God cares about 
in the communities in which you live. I used to chat to Kathy, now people pay me to talk. It's like really cool. Um, <laughs> I'm not here for the money, but I'm flying home with money. Uh, I, I ask kids all the time, do you want my job? They all do. Then I tell them to develop a heart of character because we were not hired for our intellect. I think to an extent we were hired for our character because the heart will always rule. And now that will preach. Um, there's a big clock up there. John wants me to watch. Um, <laughs> the, one of the things I, I want to briefly mention to you is that I am a chatty Cathy because I'm word smart. There's eight different ways that we are intelligent. Understanding this will change you and the children who you love. It's one of the books. We, all of you received a free one of my books in your bag. I'm happy to give that to you. I'll autograph at the end tonight if you'd like. But one of the books I wrote that I'm so excited that John was willing to write the foreword to is a book called Eight Great Smarts. I'm word smart. I think with words. I talk and I write for a living. I did it when I was a child. Logic smart people think with questions. How many of you have those kids at home or those people in your life? How many of you are married to this? Always questions. Always more questions. Never the answers, but always the questions. Um, picture smart people think with their eyes. In fact, if I came back here in a year wearing this, some of you would remember which is why when I get home, I take pictures of what I wore, put them in a photo album. <laughs> Am I, how many of you know I'm speaking truth? You would, some of you would remember. Look at that. And you would judge me for that. <laughs> now, if you were a little bit more like a word smart person, you'd remember my words. They're much more important than this outfit, although I, look, I hope it's okay. <laughs> By the way, these are my good shoes. If you think I left them in Fort Worth, I didn't. I have a bad foot. This is what I'm allowed to wear. If it's a problem, get over it. Um, <laughs> because there's a lot of other things that you need to be concerned about. So we're word smart, logic smart, picture smart, music smart, hello. Music smart people think with rhythms and melodies, can sing and tune, play a, a few instruments, and they make noise, even when you don't want them to. And then there's body smart people who think with movement and touch, and there's nature smart people who would rather be outside than inside, and will come to faith in Christ because of the creator, Jonah, Noah, Psalm 23, Psalm 46, and the rocks that will cry out. And then there's people smart people who can motivate or manipulate, and think really well with other people. And then there's self-smart people who think deeply inside of themselves. And their opinions are highly important to them. <laughs> which is a problem in our culture. Um, so there are eight different ways of being smart. And it's important that John and myself, and John's wife Sarah, and so many other people, because if people don't think they're smart, they don't show up. If people don't think they can compete in the world of intellect, they give up, underperform, drop out, and don't volunteer and commit, and I could go on and on and on. Now, spelling is a problem for me. I don't know if any of you can relate to that, but I'm very logic smart. I want the rules to work. They don't. Why do we call it a rule? That's an authority issue. Um, so my last name is spelled K-O-C-H. We pronounce it Cook. That's ridiculous. Um, quicksand is slow, and boxing rings are square. And when your alarm clock goes off, it goes on. <laughs> then we don't need the letter C. It gets in the way. It makes the K sound and the S sound. We got those covered. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blow your mind. Ready? Hold on. The number four has a U in it. The number 14 has a U in it. Spell 40. I would never say I cannot spell, that's a lie. And I would never say spelling is hard, that's a lie. What I will say is spelling does not come naturally to me. Do not lie to yourselves. And do not allow children you love or children you don't even love lie to themselves. Don't let your weaknesses win. So God says to me, Kathy, write a book. And I'm like, but spelling? <laughs> He's like, really? The only reason I'm an author is because I've chosen by God's grace to not let my weaknesses win. There are so many people who celebrate their weaknesses, which is why they don't think God is good. If you let your weaknesses win, you're in big trouble, and so is everybody around you. Lead with your strengths. Don't let your weaknesses win. It might be the thorn in your side. Another quick story. Um, I used to be too tall. I was about six, and I walked home from the elementary school that I went to, and I said, Mom and Dad, I, I'm, Mommy, I'm, I'm just too tall, and I was clumsy, and I praise God my mom didn't say, well, get over it. You're going to be tall. Look at us. Like a six-year-old would have understood that. She heard my heart cry. The most important thing you'll ever do is hear a child's heart cry. Mommy, I don't want to be tall anymore. 
She told my dad, her husband, that very night, we have a daughter with a perceived problem that can be changed. She's kind of clumsy, perceived problem that can't be changed. She is tall. What are we going to do? And by the end of the week, I was enrolled in tap dance class. I'll prove it. That's called a shuffle ball change step. <laughs> Boom. And what's more important than that is that I got to be, I like these people. I, I got to be the center of the back row, a position of high honor that only the tallest girl was allowed to have. So I went from being too tall, a little boy said to me, oh lady, you're not too tall, I think you're very cool tall. Yes. <laughs> it's a strength. Feels like a weakness sometimes, can't hide in a crowd. I could be down there, you could see me, it's a strength. I have no trouble putting my suitcases in the overhead bin, it's a strength. <laughs> Don't lie to yourself. Don't lie to yourself. We have young people who believe a strength is a problem, they're trying to change what they should leave alone. Because no one has had the guts to look them in the eye and say, stop it, this is a good thing about you. And I am not judging any of you. I know it's hard. But the boldness of deep love requires that we say yes to the yes things and no to the no things without apology. I do have a bad foot, I've diagnosed, don't talk to me about medical, I'm, I'm, I'm there you guys. Um, I'm in pain almost all the time. But you don't let the challenges win. You don't. If you do, then God doesn't win. Maybe it's the thorn in my side. You know what? It makes me rely on God. The weakness allows me to rely on other people. My staff proofreads for me, and I'm the PhD and founder of my own ministry. Humble yourself, good Lord. <laughs> the foot pain requires that I ask for a stool. John knows I'm, I'm standing because it's a short talk. I, am, I was on a stool. It's okay. And I was created with a low voice. How many of you have turned to your neighbor and said, you know, she sounds like a guy? Like, I know that. <laughs> like, I've chosen to not live in denial. Um, I know I have a low voice. I'm called sir a lot. It's not cool. Um, now, it's funny to drive through a restaurant, which, by the way, your daughter's about to learn how to drive. It's not called a drive through restaurant for any sensible reason, young lady. You don't drive through it. <laughs> I mean, hello, English language. Why do they call it that? Somebody help me with that. But... When you drive up to the, the menu, they can't see you, and you order your food, and they'll say, that'll be 482 at the window, sir. <laughs> well, I have a low voice, period. It's lower amplified. <laughs> Why get mad at what they do not know? Did you hear that? Why get mad at what they do not know? Drive 50 yards, and I become a woman. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so you're mature enough that I can say I did not change my gender. Um, and, and the kid who's working there is looking down at the receipt, looking up. I think there's supposed to be a guy in this car. Um, it's actually one of the reasons I like Chick-fil-A, because they ask you for your name when you place your order. It's just easier. Did you know that the research says low voices have more authority than high voices? Did you know that low voices carry further in a room than high voices? Do you know that if I'm in a gymnasium with 500 kids we can, and the sound system is so bad we can turn it off and my voice carries to the back of the room? <laughs> Did you know that I've been to 30 countries and I don't need a sound system? Because God gave me a sound system, my voice. <laughs> God knew what he was doing. Yeah, you can clap. Yeah. I mean, thank you. I mean, that's my choice to see it as good. Why? Because I believe God is good. Why? Created in his image. It's so significant. I've been told by Jim Daly, a focus on the family, Kirk Cameron, I've been in a movie with him. I have the perfect radio voice. <laughs> God knew what he was doing when he chose in his love to make me me. And God knew what he was doing when he chose in his love to make you you. And one of the passions of my heart is that you would believe that in the believing of your believing, walking forward, asking God to reveal more of his goodness in his creative, personal intent. When I was young, 
I didn't like my height when I was young. I was a chatty Cathy. When I was young, my voice was a bit off. When I was young, spelling was embarrassing. Praise God, I lived long enough. Quickly, Psalm 139, 13 and 14. David writes, For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. We know from the Holy Word of God that we were knit together in our mother's womb. Now, knitting is a precise skill. The knitter decides in advance the color of the yarn, the size of the needles, the size of the stitch, and what to make. If not, you have a mitten, scarf, hat, afghan, glove, sweater, ugly thing with no purpose. (laughs) God decided in advance how to make you and who to make you. You were knit together. And then David writes, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Fearfully is the same fear as fear God in the Old Testament, not to be afraid, but to be standing in awe. You are created in his image for his good and his glory. To know that means you stand strong and firm. And you walk not wounded, but healed, I pray. And if there's wounded people here, we respect that. And it would be an honor to speak with you. You are wonderfully made, set apart, uniquely designed by the creator. I love to tell middle schoolers that if they ever get lost, a bloodhound can find them after smelling something that is theirs because nobody smells like them. Oh, good thing, you know. And did you know, did you know that God is so creative that nobody has your fingerprints and nobody ever will? But more important than your scent and your fingerprints, nobody has your brain cells. One ounce of liquor kills the communication potential of 20,000 of them, especially if you're under the age of 25 and your brain isn't finished yet. Oh, to tell people that. And your passion, your delight, your purpose, your love, uniquely created in you by God. The verse ends, my soul knows it very well. David writes that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. His works are wonderful, and David knew that full well, and we were knit together. And then he writes, my soul knows it very well. And I want to say to you that the day I woke up, and my soul knew very well that my voice was my voice everything changed. When I woke up one day and I knew in the knowing of my knowing that my voice was my voice and therefore it was right and it was good, it allows me to cope with this. There are evil, deceived, lost, and angry people without hope who are jealous of those of us who are comfortable in our own skin and don't know what to do with it. I would pray that you would know in the knowing of your knowing that God did a good thing when he chose in his love to make you you so that your soul knows it very well so that in a hard day you can rip it, burn it, and move on. Because God makes no mistakes And we are who we are supposed to be for his good and for his glory. If I was young today, I would probably wonder if I was a guy. I have the greatest empathy for young people. I have the greatest concern for children. They are coming to their confusion naturally. And I will say with great integrity, if I was their age being called sir, I would probably be wondering if I was supposed to be a guy and is there a mistake here. Please love them in their confusion. Feel their pain before you try to solve the problem. And just quickly, I don't want to hijack my whole voice, but my whole speech, but we know that the gender identity confusion is a huge, murky mess, even up here in your area. And I just want to say that sexuality has nothing to do with a guy liking pink and a girl playing with trucks. Sexuality has nothing to do with the tenor of your voice. How many of you were tomboys? How many of you women were tomboys when you were girls? Do you know that right now the transgendered movement is attacking tomboys? I don't want you to do it now, but I dare you to look at Wikipedia at how they define tomboy. And I want you to understand that they are recruiting and targeting those who they think don't fit well in their own gender. It's a lie from the devil that a girl can't climb a tree, play with a truck, and that a boy can't carry a doll. And if you don't believe that, I would ask that you would consider that we might be right here tonight. Homosexuality has the word sex in it. How can an eight-year-old know? 
Homosexuality is not dictated by personality. Sexuality is dictated by who you sleep with. It's actually not all that complicated. But we're judging and watching the presentation of people and assuming that they might be wrong. Is this making sense with you? So I'm, a, I'm not too tall. I'm cool tall. And I have a cool voice, actually, that carries really well. And spelling is a challenge, but I don't let that weakness win. And so I'm in a little bit of pain. It doesn't really matter. I'll wake up tomorrow and be fine. What's your story? Why are you the who you are? And what do you know full well that God did that was good? What's your story? You know, quickly, children can only be who God created them to be. They cannot be whatever they want to be. One of the greatest lies we have told generations, you might have heard it in your childhood, you can be whatever you want. Hello, gender identity confusion 101. You can be whatever you want. How many of you heard that when you were a kid? Just work harder. Now we have people guilty who they can't become because now they don't think they're working hard enough. No, it's such a broken... I, you know, I, I like to say, because I feel like you should laugh right now because it's really serious in here and it makes me really nervous. So here we go. I could have not been a jockey on a horse. How many of you just saw that? Like scary? Like I am eating my knees. You can't be whatever you want to be. You can be who God created you to be. A picture smart, body smart, nature smart, people smart, introverted, sometimes extroverted, child of the king of kings. Oh my goodness, you guys. Children need to know that they have a story. And so do you. I was with a group of young children a number of years ago. And they were nice enough to send me thank you notes. And I thought I would read you three of them. Trent. Thank you for motivating me to the next chapter of my story. They're desperate to know that they have a story. You get to tell them their story. As you see their creator God unravel it for them. Michaela. I am a unique miracle. I'm special, but I don't brag about it. <laughs> I will find my true story when I'm older. I don't know now. Because my story is just starting. When you help them launch with integrity, According to God's creative personal intent made in his image, you give them the power to say no to all the lies and yes to the truth. And then, Hunter, you have reminded me that I'm a one-of-a-kind miracle. I did not know I had a story. But now that I do know, I can't wait to find out what my story is. God bless you for all that you do for them. Thank you. follow that. <laughs> Hi, I uh, am here to talk about a difficult uh, topic, not that we haven't been discussing many difficult topics, and uh, I wrote a book which is out on the back table, kind of right there. You may take a copy or a couple of copies, you may leave money or take it, I don't care. If you have a friend that needs one, great, take two. If you have a couple friends, fine. If you have four or five that need this book, we need to talk afterwards. So, um, uh, and I'm going to talk to you about a topic of suicide, and I'm going to bring two streams of knowledge uh, into that. Um, the first is medicine, and I'm trained as a physician, and... Um, 
uh, used to run an emergency department and a chief of staff at a hospital. And I'm not sure if you realize, but uh, one of the hardest things about being an emergency doctor is that nobody in the world wants to hear from you. If you call another doctor, you just ruin their office schedule, you woke them up, etc. And nobody wants to get a call out of the blue from a doctor in an emergency department that a family member is there. But I, I, I realize that God is training me how to, how to say and break hard news. I had to call somebody once and say, I have bad news and really bad news for you. And they said, wow, what's the bad news? I said, I looked your labs over you have 48 hours to live. And they said, what's the really bad news? I said, couldn't get a hold of you yesterday. <laughs> so so I'm, I'm going to bring that, that thought, uh, thinking about, about suicide from a physician's point of view and, and really from the classic physician's. Uh, from uh, a tradition that started in about 400 to 430 uh, BC with Hippocrates, in which as a physician you swear never to assist in a suicide, never to assist in an abortion, and never to take advantage of somebody who's poor. And I believe this. <clears throat> but the, most of the time I practiced medicine, I was not a Christian. Um, I was a, the person you would bet would never become a Christian. And at 47, uh, I'll tell you, is it okay if I tell you my testimony, just real short version? <clears throat> when I was 47, uh, uh, things had really started going r bad in, in life. I'm married uh, um, to a woman from a Jewish family. That's why I went to med school. It's the only way to get on the good side of your mother-in-law. Um, and, and I have two children. And one after another, things just started going wrong in our life. And my uh, wife's only brother drowned in front of my children. And I had a patient uh, who became obsessed with me, did really scary things. Police went and looked in his house, and his mother was uh, taped up in a closet where he'd beaten her to death sometime in the week beforehand. And kind of the culmination of the bad things, and my, my marriage was falling apart. Um, my wife was depressed, she wouldn't get treated. Uh, and the culmination of things was on a beautiful fall morning, we lived on the coast of Maine. Uh, I got home from working at night, and my wife, came from the post office and said, turn on the television, something's really bad, and it was 9-11. And um, <clears throat> most of you remember where you were. Uh, and then I got a call from our next door neighbor who had a son, my son's age, like growing up together. And she called and she said, I need your help getting, his, uh, getting Jamie from school. His father was in the first plane. <clears throat> so, all this bad stuff was happening, and I woke up to the fact that there was evil on the planet. And evil is not a scientific concept. It is a spiritual concept. And if there's evil in the world, I begin to wonder, well, where's the good come from? And, and there's good in medicine. <clears throat> I, uh, I used to be amazed when we'd run a trauma code, not even knowing a person's name, um, and do you not think God was on our side when we were doing that? <clears throat> well, I'm trying to save a stranger. So anyways, I, I knew there was good, and I went looking for the source of this and something to make sense out of my life and this terrible marriage and et cetera, et cetera. And I, and I read the Ramayana, and I read the Bhagavad Gita, and I read the Koran, and, and a number of other books. And there are truths in that book, but there was no answer. Uh, for me. And then one day in the hospital, um, uh, it's Sunday morning. By the way, if you're going to have a heart attack, do it Sunday morning. You, you'll get seen so much faster, okay? <laughs> um, so uh, it's Sunday morning, and there's no patients there. 
and I uh, went looking for something to read, and there was an orange book on a coffee table, and I picked it up, and it said, Holy Bible, and I thought, I have never read this thing. And we don't have one in our house, and our house had a library in it and everything, and there's no way I can finish reading this before the first patient comes in. <laughs> and so I stole it. <clears throat> <laughs> and... Uh, where, where do you start reading in a Bible? It's a big book. And fortunately, my parents had named me Matthew and not Numbers. And, <laughs> and, and that's where I began. And <clears throat> so those are the two streams of thought uh, as being a Christian. By the way, all, everyone in my family became believers uh, after that. Um, yes. <clears throat> So, I'm going to discuss a hard topic, suicide. Raise your hand if you have lost a friend or a family member to suicide. Raise your hand. That's a lot of hands. Raise your hand if you've lost a friend or a family member to overdose. Lots more hands. Um, suicide is... Uh, so, by the way, I'm going to talk about the prevalence of suicide. What does the Bible have to say about it? Is it the unforgivable sin? What is the church uh, doing and what should we be doing? So I'll get organized here for you. So how prevalent is it? Well, you can see by the numbers of hands that go, by the way, number of people who, uh, friend or family of us won the megabucks. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Suicide is so prevalent in our society. In the coming year, 10 million Americans are gonna wrestle with whether or not to end their own lives. 10 million. A million and a half of them are gonna end up being treated in an emergency department. We are at the traditional high rate of suicide that was reached in the Great Depression, but let me tell you that that really is a false statistic. We are multiple, multiple times higher because in 1930, when that, was, that rate was reached that was so high, it was a lot easier to kill yourself. Today, we have 9-11 system. We have emergency departments. They didn't have those back then. We have people trained. Um, we have an ability to find out what you've overdosed on very rapidly. We can reverse narcotics. We can reverse benzodiazepine. We can reverse digoxin. It goes on and on and on. And if people cannot breathe for themselves, we have ventilators. The bottom line is, if we took the one and a half million people back to 1930 and had to treat them with that technology, we would have uh, probably closer to a million people a year committing suicide. We are uh, experiencing something that's never been experienced in all of history. Um, it's an epidemic. <clears throat> And, um, and, and the demographic is changing. Uh, remember I told you everybody in my family got saved? My son, as a 14-year-old, had a, a vision of being a missionary doctor, and uh, that's what he does. He's uh, <clears throat> a one-man baby-saving machine in Africa, runs a very large uh, pediatrics department at Tenwick Hospital, um, and... Um, <clears throat> yes, said with reverence, I love it, uh, Tenwick. Um, and uh, he just uh, came home for a furlough, and when he comes home, he goes on, on, back on uh, staff at University of Kentucky, and after his first shift where he ran the inpatient department, um, he got home, he said, Dad, you're really on to something. When I left, when I was here the last time, 5% of our patient population in the pediatrics department were there for suicide. It's over a third now. And, and so um, we're, we're just seeing something that, so prevalence-wise, there's really nothing that's ever been like this. And over the last three decades, America has tried to grapple with this. And we have done everything that the mental health uh, uh, experts have told us to do. And every year, um, it gets about 2% worse. And the recommendation is to do more of the same thing. Um, it's interesting. There's, um, there's a role of faith here. Traditionally, 
It's been known and it's been studied for about a century and a half that a committed Christian is about four to six times less likely to commit suicide than an atheist. Something about believing in Christ protects people from suicide. And I was taught that even though I went to one of the most secular schools um, uh, that you can go to, George Washington University, nonetheless, we were told to at least encourage people if they had a faith because that would protect them. And yet, today is being completely expunged from the discussion of suicide. If you get the 62-page CDC um, guide called Preventing Suicide, a Technical Package of Policy Programs and Practices, faith is nowhere mentioned. <clears throat> There's a problem with that because suicide um, is one of those areas just like evil and it, just like goodness where we move out of the realm of science into something else, the spiritual realm. No animal on this planet commits suicide. Only humans do. There's never been a zebra that woke up one morning and said to heck with it. <laughs> I am not running from the lion today. It's, it's just not there. And so we have to begin to look at the Bible and, and try to figure out another way of approaching this. And if you open up a Bible, you don't have to go very far until you, you, you find this discussion. On the first page, essentially, Adam and Eve were told not to do one thing. And God said, if you do it, you will commit suicide. Surely you will die. And they went and they did it and they had help. Someone was pushing them. And so one of the things I did in, in Hope Always in this book is to do a survey through Scripture. What happens, by the way, it was Satan that was doing the pushing. What happens when Satan shows up in Scripture? And Satan doesn't show up all that many times, but every time he does, there is a trail of dead bodies. In the book of Job, the whole thing is Satan trying to get Job to commit suicide. Curse God and die is the poetry of Job for commit suicide. You don't curse God and just have your heart stop. And that's what uh, Satan is trying to do with Job. And, 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 uh, and Satan does this with Judas. He enters into, uh, into Judas and Judas betrays Christ and commits suicide. Um, if you think about it, um, there's a story, if you're not familiar with it, there's a story where Jesus goes to a person called the, known generally as the demoniac, uh, this person who's out of his mind um, with mental illness. And Jesus goes and he takes these demons and he, and he throws them into this giant herd of, of pigs. And the pigs go and do the one thing animals never do. What do they do? They commit suicide. Even when Satan and Christ are, are having this conversation known as the temptations, one of the things that Satan tries to get Jesus to do is what? Jump. Jump. Commit suicide. Satan wants you dead. And he would prefer that you do it sooner rather than later. On the other hand, if you go through Scripture and you look at what happens when people are at the end of their rope, they're ready to commit suicide, but they call out to God. And this happens to many people. Moses says, I don't want to live. Elijah says, I don't want to live. Jonah says, I don't want to live. David says, I don't want to live anymore. Those people, when they cry out to the Lord, they have a different result. The Lord comforts them, puts them to bed, feeds them, uh, has them sleep, gives them a different job. Uh, even chides them if they're being kind of foolish, as in Jonah's case. But the results are completely different. Jesus gives the bottom, bottom line about suicide and what is going on in John 10.10. 10. The thief, Satan, comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came 
that we may have life and have it abundantly. The issue of suicide is a spiritual battle. Um, <clears throat> if you ever hear a voice telling you that the world would be better off without you, that you would be better off just to end things, that is not your voice, that is the voice of Satan. Um, there's no way to sugarcoat that. It just is. Okay, so i got to move fast. Is suicide the unforgivable sin? And a lot of people will jump and they'll, they'll start trashing the Catholic Church. And I'm going to defend the Catholic Church here. Um, because the Catholic Church and the church in general, up until 150 years ago, was the, only the church was the only institution in Western society charged with preventing suicide. And you know what? They did a better job of it than we do with all our helicopters and ambulances and hospitals and one out of every eight Americans being on an antidepressant. They did a better job. And they pointed uh, to, to, to lines out of uh, Scripture, um, uh, such as this. Do you not know that you are are God's temple, and that God's spirit dwells in you. You're not an accident. You're not a piece of protoplasm. You're a temple of the Lord. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy. You are holy because you're made in the image of God. You are that temple. Having said that, I believe um, that God's, Jesus' work on the cross can cover any sin you can come up with. If you place your trust in Christ in life, I believe that if you commit suicide, you have reason um, to, to hope that you would go to heaven. But if you did not place your trust in, in Christ, you, you can't preach somebody into heaven uh, from that. Um, I give you Romans 8, uh, the end of the, the chapter, verses 38 through 39. This is Paul talking. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depths, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? Okay. Um, all right. The church and suicide. And I'm really putting the pedal down here. Am I doing okay? Or, all right. The church and suicide. What has the church been doing? I want you to raise your hand if you have uh, ever heard a sermon on suicide. One, two. Three, that's what the church has been doing about suicide, staying utterly quiet. Um, there's a problem with that. I, I, had, uh, I live in Lexington, Kentucky, and there was a group coming through town, a church group, about 100 or so uh, high school students with a church group that tours uh, doing music, and their pastor said, can, can they come and talk to you? And I said, absolutely. And so we talked, and we weren't talking about suicide, but one of the students said, Dr. Sleeth, what are you working on now? And I said, I'm working on a book about suicide. And you could hear a pin drop. I found out that one of the gals um, had just lost a first cousin that week to suicide. And that there was a nurse traveling with this group because two of the students were on suicide watch. And I said, has anyone ever told you that suicide is wrong? No. Has anyone in the church ever discussed this with you? No. That's what the church has been doing about suicide. And um, I think there's three things wrong with that. The first is that it's not biblical. Jesus Christ made absolutely no distinction between mental and physical illness. There is none. We are fallen. The reason we're not, you know, perfect is because of the fall. And that affects the mind and affects the body. Actually, in point of fact, Jesus went out of his way for those that had mental illness. 
the story about the demoniac, that's Jesus, a kosher rabbi, going to a stinking pig farm to save somebody. <clears throat> um, and if you, if, you, uh, if, if you think about it, if somebody in your church got cancer, well, it might be announced from the pulpit, um, a prayer uh, chain might be uh, enacted, there might be rides to the doctors given, meals planned for. In a good church, somebody's going to write you a check because there's always extra expenses with, with cancer. And you know, there's nothing wrong with any of that except for there's not one case of cancer in the Bible. But how, what do you think happens when somebody is struggling with depression? Or somebody is struggling with bipolar disease or schizophrenia. The church remains silent. And the thing that's wrong with that is it's not biblical. Number two, I think that the other thing is that the church remains silent on this. Suicide is going to be normalized. It will happen within five years. What do I mean by that? I mean that if the church doesn't wake up, and we've got to go from three hands going up to everyone going up within a couple of years, or this isn't going to work. But if the church doesn't wake up, suicide's going to be normalized, and you're going to be able to go to the drugstore, and there's going to be a, you're, you're making a life choice section in the greeting cards. The country just north of us, I won't name names, <clears throat> its initials are Canada, um, <laughs> has the MAID law, the medical assistance in dying. And about four or five months ago, it was amended so that um, if somebody wants to commit suicide, they no longer have to have the 10-day waiting period. They no longer have to have death being imminent. And, and they, they can have only mental illness as, as a cause for that. And they have the right to demand that a physician help them. This is coming in this direction. And the way things work is you will become an emancipated minor if, if you want to commit suicide. One of the weirdest moments in my life was I was a senior resident, was talking to an 11-year-old girl, begging her to let me call her mother because she had just given birth, which made her an emancipated minor. She's got all the rights of a 25-year-old. Can you imagine this happening where a 10-year-old or 11-year-old can go in and demand to be killed? And this is coming. In my, in my uh, city of Lexington, within three months' time, we had a 10-year-old, 11-year-old, 12-year-old, 13-year-old, and a 14-year-old kill themselves. Um, so... First problem with ignoring it is it's not biblical. Second problem is that it's going to become normalized. And the third problem is I believe that we put our own souls at risk by not reaching out to these people. Consider um, this scripture here. It's from the Proverbs. If you hold back from rescuing those taken away to death, those who go staggering to the slaughter, if you say, look, we did not know this, does not he who weigh, weighs the heart perceive it? And will he not repay man according to his deeds? Is what it says, Psalms 24, uh, Proverbs 24. Ladies and gentlemen, you and I are our brothers and sisters keepers. That's one of the reasons God put us here on earth, is to rescue those. So I... Um, I want to honor uh, the time here. Um, I, I want you to get one of these books. I want you to encourage people to read it. I don't make money from it. It all goes into a nonprofit. Um, there's uh, somebody uh, here who's been a champion uh, for getting me into churches. Pastors, uh, surprisingly, will not let me into church to preach about this. Um, there's a reason nobody's hands going up. It's got to be a group like this. It's got to be people like John, who, who's got the courage to let me get up here and say the truth. Um, and you've got to be deputized uh, to help with that. The book Hope Always isn't about why people uh, commit suicide. It's about why people don't. 
I went to people from age 93 down to teenagers who came right to the brink of this or tried it and said, what got you over it? We've got to get people over this. Now, I want to leave you with two encouragements. Number one, I was talking to, uh, at a worship service, 150 guys, and there's a story about an, uh, a suicide almost in the Bible in the book of Acts. Paul and Silas have been locked up in jail in Philippi. And there's an earthquake and the torches go out and the doors spring off. That's why Philippi was eventually abandoned was because of the earthquakes there. And the jailer, uh, believing that he's failed totally in his job, yells that he's going to kill himself. Now all Paul and Silas and the other prisoners have got to do is stay silent and they can go free. And I leaned forward and I asked the 150 guys, what would you guys do? And they took it real seriously because we were in a maximum security prison. <clears throat> but the rest of the story is Paul calls out, don't kill yourself, we're here. People need to hear that we're here. Um, and uh, the second story is um, that when this book had just come out, um, a, a radio station in Louisville, Kentucky had me on. There's two pastors that run it. I've been on the show a number of times. They took me out to lunch uh, to begin with. Um, and one of them said, Matthew, I've got a friend, uh, somebody I haven't seen for decades and decades. I knew him uh, in childhood, but he's re lived a really, really um, you know, trying life. He's had um, uh, two sons um, that have died from this plague of, of um, deaths of despair. Um, and he has a gun and a plan to use it. Would you mind if he sat in the studio while we talked about this? No pressure. <laughs> and we sat in the studio, and at the end of the show, the three of us laid hands on this man, and prayed for him. That was on a Thursday. This was him on Sunday. Yeah. People who are wrestling with this need to hear from the church, we're here, not silence. Let me leave you with a, a, a prayer, a benediction, from Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. singing Amazing Grace.
Thank you so much for being here tonight. Amy, Aww. you're the best. <laughs> so yeah. God bless. Thank you so much for being here. Good night.